Years ago, two men out in the woods of the Ozarks found themselves in a shocking situation. They were observing what they thought to be a family of strange animals. However, what came next was horrifying. Upon observing one of the younglings, one of the men witnessed the most terrifying predator he's ever seen. The only problem is it's not supposed to exist. You won't want to miss this one. This first story feels like it comes right from the X-Files. Several years back, two unidentified eyewitnesses who were also, as they called themselves, experienced Bigfoot investigators were in the middle of doing some thorough research. As it turns out, they actually have a family group of Bigfoot living in this area that they're observing. And sometime in October of this year, which was never specified, during a full moon, these two eyewitnesses were at a large hilltop and were in the middle of checking out one juvenile and one adult that they could see, or at the least hear. There, they were able to kind of hear them walking around in the leaf litter and with other additional noises. Now, interestingly, every once in a while, they would also hear this strange clack of wood or even a knock that went off in multiple directions. After some time, this observation changed in feeling from fun to one of being a lot more cautious. One of the men had heard a noise to the north direction and decided to venture that way to try and investigate while the other ones stayed back at camp, you know, to make sure there wasn't some sort of diversion. Within moments, he comes rushing back and he begins exclaiming that he had just seen one of these juveniles come out of the wood line, running from one side to the other, and it was being followed by something he couldn't even begin to comprehend, another creature. As a matter of fact, he would go on to describe that it was roughly six feet tall and had pointed ears and a long snout. And so his partner is just sitting there listening to him, thinking that, this had to have been some sort of mistaken identification of a Bigfoot or a bear, which, if you hear this, is pretty ironic that a Bigfoot researcher is claiming misidentification. Now, I'm not knocking Bigfoot researchers, but this is just because they don't really give any credence to the whole dogman, werewolf, or grassman theory. Fortunately, the man who had stayed back at camp had just recently purchased a 40 caliber handgun and some hydro shock ammunition for it earlier that day and was close by in his vehicle. Not wasting any more time or risking any potential dangers, he goes back to his vehicle, grabs his weapon, and loads it. And while this is happening, they could hear these two young juvenile Bigfoot chattering and the adults, the big one, stomping all the way to their backside. From what they could tell, these things were angry and upset about something. They just weren't sure what. The two of them decided to go back down to the fire break, which is the same area where the one man saw this strange wolf-like creature, and using spotlights, they thoroughly scanned the area for any clues of something they could see. While they didn't see anything at first, they could hear something really big moving around, and it was followed by a few short growls. Now, after continuously scanning the area, the one man happened to catch it with a spotlight as it was darting between the trees. Now, at this point, now that it was fully illuminated, both men witnessed it. And folks, the descriptions are as clear as you can get. It was a six foot tall wolf walking on its hind legs. You might think this is something out of a fictional vampire novel, but for these two men, this was as real as you could possibly get. The man with the 40 caliber handgun fired his weapon in the air, bam! And this thing immediately turned around to the southeast and darted off into the woods not wanting to hang out any longer than necessary. And so what do they do? They decided to cautiously make their way back to camp, and the entire time, they could hear this thing pacing them to their left-hand side. As you can imagine, this would make anyone very nervous and uncomfortable because you really have no idea what you're dealing with. If this is some sort of unidentified predator, then the unpredictability of the situation alone would give you nightmares. 
Now, fortunately, they made it back to the camp safely, but they just kept listening to this thing as it began approaching them from the woods. The one man turned his spotlight right on the section of woods where they could hear it coming, whereas the other one leveled his gun wherever the sound would be coming from. This thing did not seem to have a fear of either of these men, and it was clear they were being stalked, just as it had done to the two juveniles. That's when it happened. This thing steps out from between the two trees, and without hesitating for a second, the man lifts up his gun and fires several shots pow, 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 that hit square in the ribs at a distance of only about 20 yards, so very close. And because of that short distance, the eyewitness was able to measure this the very next day, and he is a very good shot, so that's how he knows it's around 20 yards. Also, he saw the wound clear as day and knows without a shadow of a doubt that he made an impact. After it was shot, it fell to the ground, kind of scrambling and immediately got up and then ran in the southeastern direction. Now, this thing was quick. They could hear it crashing through the brush, making all sorts of noises, and it, they could even hear it as it tripped multiple times, but it never faltered. It just continued moving in the southerly direction and the entire time going down the hill, paralleling the firebreak. If you're not a robot and are even remotely human, you could just imagine how terrified both of these men were, and without skipping a beat, they quickly broke down camp and left. But the next morning, they must have got brave because uh, they loaded up a few extra clips and went back to the area just to see if it had died somewhere close by, or, you know, maybe was wounded and they'd be able to possibly track it down via a blood trail. Fortunately, they were able to track it from the point of where he had shot it initially, and they were able to kind of follow it all the way down to the canyon and even found where it had made such a ruckus, where it had fell. But keep in mind though, they weren't able to track it because of a blood trail, like they had initially thought they would. It was due to the leaf litter and at one point or another, they did find a perfect canine track in a mud ridge, and it was well over eight inches across. But keep in mind that the fact that there was no blood trail at all after visibly taking a bullet and reacting to it, which further proved that it got shot, completely baffled both of them. And after tracking it a ways down to the canyon, they had completely lost the trail. Not really sure what to do from this point, other than just accept it as something scary and mysterious, they decided to confide in a Native American couple that they're both familiar with, and after some conversation, this Native American couple explained to them that this was a skinwalker, a shapeshifter in the flesh. Now, trying to keep their options open as best they could, they made contact with a few other investigators just to try and figure out what to make of all this. As you can imagine, they were not able to get anything concrete back. What's interesting is that the eyewitness stated once again that they never entertained the idea of a dogman, which for those of you who don't know, is said to be an upright or bipedal wolf humanoid spotted by many eyewitnesses all throughout the woods of North America. They're not werewolves. Werewolves are shapeshifters. These are just wolf beings. Now, as you can imagine from being so shaken up by this incident, Neither of them have ever gone out into the woods again unarmed. If an experience like this doesn't change you, I don't know what will. The identity of the upright wolf that these men shot after being hunted that night remains a mystery. However, folks, I can't help but feel that maybe, just maybe, if he had bought a higher caliber gun, it's possible these two men would have had a body to show the world. But with ammunition prices skyrocketing in the last few years, in conjunction with ammo shortages, he probably just didn't have the funds available to make it happen. Luckily, he's got a solution. Today's sponsor, Rocket Money, is here to help. Rocket Money is the personal finance app that helps you cancel subscriptions, lower bills, and manage your money better. In fact, to save up enough money for 50 caliber bullets to hunt these things, I'm using Rocket Money to cancel my unwanted subscriptions. It safely and securely identifies recurring charges and cancels unwanted subscriptions for you. Heck, you can even cancel from within the app with just a couple of taps. No need to worry about customer service calls. And trust me when I say they won't understand the need to save money to, uh, 
hunt bipedal canines. I'm also using Rocket Money to set a budget. It will analyze your spending habits to create a custom budget that works with your goal, to bag a body of a Bigfoot or a Dogman. In fact, it automatically monitors your spending by category and gives you notifications when you've exceeded your limits. Hey babe, it says uh, right here that silver bullets might be a better option, but it doesn't recommend them if you're an overweight bearded guy who runs the channel What Lurks Beneath. Who wrote this? Go to rocketmoney.com slash whatlurksbeneath or click the link in the description to get started for free. You can also unlock even more features with premium. While the last story dealt with the paranormal and supernatural, this story deals with tragedy and mystery. On Sunday, August 28th of 2017, Rod Letterman and a close friend decided to go hiking on the Butterfield Trail in the Devil's Den State Park. At some point during their venture together, Rodney was growing tired and needed to take a break. So at this point, the two sat down on a log and just started conversing. And Rodney requested that his friend go back to his car and grab his high blood pressure medication because he forgot it. So leaving Rodney there, his friend trekked back to the car right around noon to grab it for him. And when he returned to the point on the trail where he left Rodney, he was nowhere to be found. Thinking this was weird, Rodney's friend spent some time looking for him, calling his name, backtracking, looking for any signs of Rodney. It wasn't like him to play a prank like this, especially when he was in need of his medication. Well, it wasn't long before his friend began fearing the worst. And even though the weather in that area was fairly mild for August, you do not want to underestimate the amount of drinking water that you should carry with you at all times. Unfortunately for Rodney, he was only carrying a liter and a half and had no backpack. He wouldn't be able to sustain for very long. Fearing that something serious had happened to Rodney, like a medical emergency or something, we don't know, his friend goes back down the trail again and contacts emergency services. Immediately, a full search and rescue operation begins and teams begin scouring all around the area of the Devil's Den State Park. Not only are they on foot, they're also using ATVs, they're on horses. This search even included several counties and not just the Arkansas Department of Parks and Tourism. There was a lot of people looking for Rodney. And yet, just like many of these other missing 411 cases, there was virtually no trace of this guy. At some point or another, they were able to locate the cell phone that belonged to him. But unfortunately, there didn't seem to be any other clues. To make matters worse, his wife even said that the day of this hike, he had told her he wasn't feeling well right before he went and felt very exhausted. He also didn't have his medication, and he had left his phone at the campsite. Those are all recipes for disaster. Now, as the search continued on and on, again, they could not find any traces of Rodney Letterman anywhere. Of course, other than his cell phone, there was no evidence as to where he went or what happened to him. It's very possible he went off the trail, but for what reason and why? If he wasn't feeling well because he didn't have his medication, it doesn't make any sense for him to take off when he was awaiting his friend to return. On top of that, nobody else on the trail that day saw where he had gone either or saw him walking by himself, so that does raise a bunch of questions. Unfortunately, there wasn't any evidence search and rescue could find, and he became an unsolved mystery for a couple of years. That is, until February 25th of 2019. A lone hiker who was traversing in the same Devil's Den State Park decided to venture off trail a little bit. At some point or another, this hiker stopped in his tracks because he saw something on the ground that was sort of glinting in the sunlight. And being rather curious, he bent down to pick it up, and what he found not only shocked him, but made him sick to his stomach. In his hand, he held a fragment of a human skull. Like any person would do, he called the authorities, and they were quick to come in, retrieve the fragment, and do several DNA tests on it for an in-depth profile. Well, testing takes some time, as most of us know, and at the end of March of 2019, it was official. The Washington County Sheriff's Office made a statement that the DNA test matched the skull and other skeletal remains to Rodney Letterman. However, they still could not determine a cause and manner of death. And 
here's where the story gets stranger. And this is from park officials, not just random conjecture. The area where the remains were found, the skull fragment, and from what it sounds like, other skeletal remains, it was three miles away from the visitor center. And as it turns out, this was on private land, also surrounded by U.S. Forest Service property. This basically translates to an area that is completely inaccessible due to just how remote and rugged it is. And according to the Devil's Den Park Assistant Superintendent, Tim Scott, he was more than surprised that these remains were found here. I mean, just because of how few foot traffic it gets in general. Even more disturbing is that after park officials did an in-depth reevaluation of their search records, it was discovered that this area was searched thoroughly back in 2017 in the initial round of search and rescue. So this means that Rodney managed to somehow get to this spot after the searchers departed? Now, I'm not an expert in this by any means, but if he was killed and then his body was dragged to this area where they found the remains, wouldn't there be other signs like maybe his clothing or anything else he had on him at the time? Am I just thinking aloud here because I really don't know? But the fact that even search and park officials find it bizarre and don't just immediately write it off as that he was taken out by a predator and drug into this area definitely should say something. The Butterfield hiking trail where all this happened is 14.6 miles and is relatively popular. It's also not an easy hike and has been rated as difficult. I mean, if you look, the terrain, it's pretty rough. There's lots of uphills, loose rocks, there's downed trees covering the trail, and a lot of overgrown vegetation. Remember, we are dealing with the tragic loss of human life, and so I want to try and cover this as respectfully and tastefully as I can. So let's use this as an opportunity to send nothing but love and prayers to the Letterman family who are still grieving and dealing with this horrible pain and loss. Unfortunately, whatever happened to Rodney that day and how his remains ended up in the location that they were found remain unknown. Why is it that cemeteries are so creepy? Is it because of the spirits that are said to linger there? Or is it because there have been sightings of creatures in the night that are, for whatever reason, drawn to it? As you're going to find out in this story, there's not one or two, but three sightings. Years ago, in Fayetteville, Arkansas, a family had a set of bizarre experiences and sightings right near a small white house near the Wesley Cemetery on Highway 74. And on the first night in question, this family was just nonchalantly on their way home from Fayetteville, and it was probably anywhere around 11 to 11.30 at night. Again, just an ordinary mundane evening. They were talking, having a normal trip home. But folks, what starts off as normal never stays normal. The husband, who was driving at the time, immediately went quiet after they had passed this white house that sat right across from the cemetery. He had saw something that he couldn't make sense of in his head, something he had tried multiple times to try and put together and to formulate it, to try and stick it in this box that we know is reality, things that can and can't be, but it defied all of that. And because of this, he was just squeezing the steering wheel as hard as he could and his knuckles are white and he couldn't take his foot off the gas. He floors it and after a few seconds goes by, he asks his family, did you guys see that? What they saw freaked them out to such an extent that they refused to drive Highway 74 for quite a while after that. Now, fast forward a little over a year, and once again, the family is coming home from Fayetteville, and they decide to take 74 again. The reason being is it's a much shorter way back home than the other route. They see this thing again, and this time, it actually moves across the road onto its legs, rolls into a ditch, and then just kind of gallops off on all fours. And they were so overtaken by fear that it immediately brought back memories of the year prior. And you'd think they would learn their lesson after this sighting, but no. So a few more months goes by and they're driving that way again. However, they would end up taking Highway 74 several more times and they had nothing happen. They did not experience anything remotely weird. So their guard went down and they felt the illusion of safety until one night. They had just got out of a late movie and it was well after midnight, maybe closer to 1.30 in the morning. And like normal, they're driving down Highway 74, they pass the White House yet again, 
And this time, something huge runs up to the side of the road and just kind of stands there on its shoulder, and it's moving in a way like it makes it look like it's breathing heavily. Now, what's really disturbing is that all of these times, all three of them, the eyewitnesses got the feeling that whatever animal this was wanted them to look at it. Being so overcome with fear, they were only able to see from a sideways glance. That's when it decided to run right in front of them. Now, going back to their first sighting and what it did, so you can understand more context, they saw something huge run across the porch of that house, run and jump off the end and do what the eyewitness described as a barrel roll. Then it stood up and ran across the field and it did so very fast. This was so large that when it was on the porch, it was hunched over and had to go down on its hands and feet just to be able to jump off the end. The hair was sparse, clearly thicker on the back and shoulders with pointed ears. And as you can imagine, it freaked the eyewitnesses out each and every time. And afterwards, the eyewitnesses were just so engrossed in watching the rear view mirror, expecting to see it coming up on them, but it didn't. The creepiest observation of all is that they noted it looked just like, in terms of shape and size, the werewolves from the Van Helsing movie. Yikes. However, it gets even creepier. All three of these sightings took place in the winter or very early spring, so there was pretty much no foliage at all, which meant that they had a much better view of this thing. Also, one thing that's incredibly disturbing is that that white house was a rent house and never once had a renter in there for more than two or three months at a time. You know, it makes you wonder what was happening in and around the area. Were people seeing or being stalked by something? It's hard to say. Something the eyewitness also noted is that they would constantly see people moving in and out of that house. Seems weird, doesn't it? I mean, once or twice, yeah, but consistently? Additionally, they noted that if anybody had an outside dog, well, it didn't last very long. Of course, it's very possible that they rehomed every animal that ever lived there, but who knows? At the time of this encounter being written down and submitted, the house has been on the market for 10 years and there's no takers. Additionally, no one keeps cattle down in that valley at all either, which again is very strange. This is a valley that's very lush, very green, perfect pastures, and it just sits empty. Is there some sort of wolf predator that hangs out in this valley of the Ozarks? Unfortunately, the answers to all of our questions regarding this story will go on to remain unknown. In this last section, we'll actually look at two separate cases that occurred back in the 1960s in the Ozarks. Both of these encounters were actually published by the incredible Albert Rosales in his massive compilation, The Humanoid Encounters Database, which all of you should totally check out, by the way. On August 1st, 1966, Kathy Palmer was a typical 14-year-old girl. She was at home, and at this point, it's about 12.30 at night. And at some point, she begins to hear this strange noise. It sounded like rattling and it was very out of place, and so it prompted her to look out the window. Now, what she sees, especially for the time and place that she's in, it's the 1960s. She saw something that would completely blow a hole in the fabric of her reality. What she saw was this large, luminous object that was bearing red and blue lights on the lawn. This was the source of the strange noise, and she made an additionally disturbing discovery. On the craft, she noticed this little square hatchway, and it opens. And she's watching all of this unfold in real time, and she is in a state of shock. She feels like she's in the middle of a sci-fi film. These two, what she would describe as five feet tall, slender men with large heads, perhaps they were wearing helmets, we don't know, it's hard to say, appeared to come out of the craft and they kind of walked around and began examining the bicycles nearby. I know, a very odd thing to do, but after some time, they went back in the craft and it disappeared. The entire experience lasted for about 30 minutes. And after they vanished, she was completely blown away by what this was. She had no idea what to make of it. Interestingly, at the landing site, the grass could be seen and it was matted down and there was this strange, bizarre white substance which would later prove to be calcium phosphate. Now, I just want to say this. 
I am by no means an expert in ufology at all, so I have no idea how calcium phosphate is in any way connected to this experience or UFOs or aliens in general. But if you, the viewer, have any understanding of the two, I would highly encourage you to educate me and all the other viewers down in the comments below. Please, I am really curious. On February 14th, Valentine's Day of 1967 in Tuscumbia, Missouri, I believe that's how you say Tuscumbia, something strange would take place that left an old man wondering, are we really expected to believe what we're told about this life? It was seven in the morning and Claude Edwards, a 64 year old farmer, saw something in one of his fields. His first impression was that maybe it was a parachute because it was a green dome shaped object, probably no more than 15 feet wide. And so he decides to leave his house to go and investigate and is wondering who landed out in his field and why. Perhaps it was a military training op, I mean, who knows? But as he got closer and closer, he began to make some very distinctive observations that proved he was dealing with something he was not equipped to handle. He was able to make out that it was resting on a shaft that was roughly 18 inches wide and then extended downward from its base. Around the edge of this dome were a number of bright multicolored lights on an oblong shape. Beneath the object were visible entities, as he would describe, all less than a meter tall. They too were also gray and green in color and moved very quickly. With these very strange wide set eyes, no visible legs and quick moving levers or arms. There was also this protuberance where the nose and mouth would have been. I think he was in a complete state of shock because he didn't really know what else to do. He just picked up a couple stones and threw it at the object. He saw it as it bounced off this invisible wall or barrier between him and the object. And he decided to get closer and he got to about 15 feet and he could feel the pressure of this invisible barrier. Whatever it was, he doesn't know. Now, keep in mind as I'm explaining all of this, this all happened within a matter of a few moments. So it's you got to try and make sense of what was going on. The surface of the object appeared seamless, like a gray greenish silk. All the while, these little robot creatures or whatever you want to call them, they all just retreated back inside the object and he noted that it rocked back and forth multiple times and then silently just vanished towards the northeast within a matter of seconds. Now, as completely bizarre as this was, he went on to further describe what these things really looked like. To him, it appeared like they were penguins that were not human and they had no visible neck. The ship or craft or object, whatever you want to refer to it as, reminded him of this big shell that was grayish green in color. What's even stranger is there were still traces of it on the site three months later. Whatever it did, it really screwed the soil up because it was extremely dehydrated in contrast with the surrounding soil. And of course, how could I forget about the depressions that were left ranging from 20 to 30 millimeters that sloped? Unfortunately, everything that I shared with you about this experience is all the intel that was gathered. Something that I find really fascinating is in the last 50 years especially, there's a lot of cases of UFOs that sound like they're straight up from a poorly written 1960s sci-fi. You hear of UFO or alien abduction cases, and most of the time it's dealing with greys or even reptilians or mantid-like beings. But then you get some of these other encounters and experiences like the ones I just shared with you that talk about these strange men in silver suits or that they appear to be robotic in some way, just really bizarre and stray far away from the norm of just gray aliens. In fact, shouting out again to Albert Rosales, if you guys check out his book, there are a ton of encounters and stories just like this one. So you tell me folks, why is it that the Ozarks is home to all sorts of strange things from anomalies to UFOs to cryptid sightings and bizarre missing 411 cases? Is there a paranormal interference into our own reality in certain hot spots of the world? And it just so happens that one of those is the Ozarks? Let me know what you think. And because you guys have made it this far into the episode, I want you to all comment down below some things in the Ozarks. So that way I know who made it to the end of the episode and who didn't. 
And if you guys enjoy content like this, where we dive into cases of the mysterious and supernatural, just like in today's episode, then what are you waiting for? Slap that like and subscribe button for more content just like this. As always, remember, I love you all, keep an open mind, and I'll see you all in the very next episode.